The fashion decade we call the 1970s really begins with the 1972 Watergate scandal, indicting a sitting president for abuse of power, and it ended in 1981 with the election of Ronald Reagan and the rise of the new right, signaling the decline of the liberalism from the 1960s and 70s. This decade saw the end of the post-World War II economic boom, bringing about an era of inflation, recessions, and high unemployment. The American public saw one disappointment after another during the energy crisis, Nixon resigning in disgrace, the Vietnam War, Three Mile Island, and the Iranian hostage crisis. The resulting era of pessimism was the exact opposite of the can-do attitude fostered by victories in World War II and the optimism of the 1960s space race. As a reaction to these setbacks, the 1970s blend a series of nostalgia waves with 1960s mod and romantic revival clothes incorporating eye-popping colors and large patterns derived from the 60s pop art. There's a reason the 1970s continue to be one of the most stylish decades of all time. The era birthed an eclectic mix of style influences that evolved quickly over the 10-year span. Because of this eclecticism, the fashion 1970s can be a daunting task to document. We will look at 10 overarching influences in the 1970s. The first is the role of politics. Many of the radical ideas of the 1960s are now widely debated in 1970s mainstream society, leading to unrest and struggles for power. The establishment will spend billions of dollars advertising, campaigns, lobbying, and social discourse that fought change with fear tactics to protect their power. The establishment leaders are now fashion followers. They step out of the fashion parade. Even couture designers took inspiration from street styles, catering to a shrinking group of clients. In 1970, the number of couture houses in Paris dropped to just 19 from the 106 re-established after the end of World War II. There were many reasons. A few are rising prices and wages, the death of monarchies all over Europe, and an increasing reluctance of consumers to spend as much on couture clothing when good quality clothing was available elsewhere. The couture does not die, it is still with us. But during the 1970s, it will significantly reinvent its business model. Traditional and establishment dressers had to decide how much concession to make toward the new fashions bubbling up from the streets and the new industrial designers. In this photo, we can see politicians in the White House wearing traditional suits. These suits were established in the 1950s, but we can see that two men at the left have added colorful wide ties and slightly longer hair. The two men at right have made no concessions to the new styles, except for slightly longer hair and maybe those sideburns. The second big influence is the women's liberation movement. Women will demand to take part in the American economy as they had done during World War II. The discussion of women's role and a rising divorce rate will directly affect the trajectory of women's wardrobes, asking what is the appropriate attire for the workplace and how much of fashion is created for the male gaze, not for women's needs. These questions will profoundly impact how women approach fashion. A fourth influence is a growing awareness of where our consumer goods come from. This is the first awakening when Americans begin to question the conditions and pay for workers. Cesar Chavez rises to fame leading campaigns to improve the lives of migrant workers. This theme will grow in importance through the rest of the century. The U.S. landed on the moon in 1969, and images of the Earth 
as a single planet shot around the world, fueling a growing unease about the health of the environment and what would happen if we lost our only home. People started questioning business methods behind the staggering economic growth of the 50s and 60s. In 1970, we had the first Earth Day celebration with 20 million people participating. Exploring environmentally sustainable manufacturing methods will start here with targeting polluting corporations and also motivating people to spend their consumer dollars with political change in mind. We have one early example of examining how far astray fashion might have wandered from the actual human needs. The Earth Shoe implemented scientific studies into how people actually walked. For the first time, consumers demanded that clothing items have a pedigree of how they were made or how they interact with the body. This is a progressive idea in the 1970s and will become more accepted by the 1990s. Wearing an Earth Shoe immediately at a glance set that person apart from others announcing their progressive political views. But it is also an early example of applying science, not solely artistic motivations, to fashion. In fact, applying science to ourselves is a large influence in the 1970s. NASA learned an extraordinary amount of information about how the human body worked and how to train it for extreme conditions. We now apply that science towards sports and toward improving our own bodies to engineer a more perfect human being. New pastimes emerge such as jogging and running in marathons. The regular public begins to buy competition grade sportswear. Before this, only serious athletes needed competition grade equipment. We have two new pop culture icons brought to us by a television show about re-engineered super people or NASA grade science applied to the body. The Six Million Dollar Man and the Bionic Woman featured two regular people revived from tragic accidents through miraculous engineering. They were always involved in training and feats of super strength. These shows popularized track suits as everyday fashion items. Before this, one wore gym wear at the gym and changed clothes to leave. Now you wanted people to know you were doing some kind of physical training. The Champion Company introduced a new performance fabric, Sports Mesh, knitted with small holes to allow the body to breathe during vigorous activity. That fabric was used in sports team jerseys and quickly transferred to regular fashion. During the 1970s, sports fans began wearing souvenir t-shirts for their favorite team, creating another avenue for sports styling, such as contrast stripes and mesh fabrics to become everyday streetwear. Sports equipment companies such as Adidas and Reebok then jumped into the fashion market, supplying sports clothing with their corporate logo, meant as advertisement. Soon, regular casual clothing reflected sports styling, including the contrast neck and sleeve bands on the bottom left, or the horizontal stripes added to this pullover shirt on the right. These styles were ubiquitous on the street in America, and they did not originate with a designer, but with manufacturers. Other high-performance sports captured the public's imagination, such as sports car racing or sailboat races. People adopted these signature styles, such as, in the photo at left, a man wearing a racing driver's suit. This kind of styling transferred to regular fashions primarily through windbreakers and jackets. A signature style element of these jackets is the tab collar. This style was intended to hold the jacket closed under the windy conditions of sailing or driving. Soon people who never drove over 50 miles per hour were wearing this style and the tab collar would migrate to other kinds of jackets, including leather jackets and coats from the time. 
Perhaps the most influential performance trend is the performance sneaker. In 1974, Foot Locker debuted at the Puente Hills Mall in City of Industry here in California. At first, it was a small specialty store catering to sports teams and athletes selling performance running and basketball shoes. The general public soon appreciated access to these professional grade shoes corresponding to the rise of the scientific health and fitness craze, along with celebrity endorsements. Now there are over 3,000 Foot Locker stores worldwide, another California contribution to American street style. The sixth influence is the wide generation gap. The younger generation will look completely different from their parents. As political and economic setbacks swirl out of control, the younger generation increasingly blamed the older generation for creating a corrupt system. Some of the younger generation will follow international fashion, such as Yoko Ono and John Lennon on the left. But many in America would create their own street styles under the influences we are exploring here. I love this photo that shows young musicians in the foreground and older generation onlookers behind them. They have all gathered for some kind of activity. There appear to be buses behind them. These two groups might as well be from different planets. Young people created their own statement out of anti-fashion, our seventh influence. One manifestation of this is wearing torn jeans and shopping in thrift stores. Both activities horrified their parents, many of whom were children during the Depression or war years, when wearing torn clothing and buying second-hand clothing meant you were poor. The 1970s generation will invent the idea of vintage clothes. Items from the 1930s have the most panache. This 1930s street style will influence the Paris couturier Yves Saint Laurent to introduce an official 1930s revival. Torn jeans could be worn simply torn, or another option was to add patches and quilt squares, beginning an early DIY movement. Another important influence is the younger generation's relaxing of gender-based fashion. Part of mainstream society's objection to 1960s space age and the hippie movement was precisely that gender blending. This will, by the 1970s, have a profound effect on everyday fashion. The young generation was drawn to non-Western cultures to explore alternative ways of living or thinking, returning to nature, to identify with their roots, or to express solidarity with some cultural issues. They adopted styles directly or single elements from Africa, South America, India, and Native American cultures. One offshoot of this interest in other cultures was the discovery of traditional dye techniques such as batik and shibori. Both techniques used a barrier such as wax or tightly tying string around areas of the fabric. Those areas then resisted color when the garment is added to a dye bath. The 1970s DIY version, tie dyeing, quickly saturated every fashion market. In the 1970s, many people began watching television for several hours a day. There were only three major networks authorized to broadcast from coast to coast, and we had no way to record a broadcast. This meant that everyone was watching about the same thing at exactly the same time. This had a huge influence on our culture, with everyone the next day talking about what had happened on each TV show. For the first time, the average American now relied more on television news instead of newspapers to hear about the day's occurrences. Sitcoms, variety shows with multiple acts or guest stars, televised sports, and special miniseries had a bigger impact on American culture than did newspapers or magazines. 
Topics that were once considered taboo were shown on television. Misogyny, racism, and gay culture were now openly defined, discussed, and challenged. Another huge celebrity influence was the music industry, tied up with boutique and trendy fashion designers since the 1960s. Whether you listened to rock and roll, punk, or funk, there were influential style icons for you. Disco and pop music indulged in a high glamour once seen only at drag balls, and icons from pop at this time found immediate fans in ball culture. Disco brought back the two and three piece suit for young people who wore them in bright colors and shiny fabrics. Mainstream designers will add disco glamour to their lines by adding feathers and sequins to cocktail and formal dresses. The average person who went to the disco captured some of this high octane glamour with colorful shirts made of silky or thin fabrics with wild prints. One influential disco group was the Village People, known for their onstage persona and costumes and suggestive lyrics. Their camp music and live act at first targeted disco's large gay customer base. The group quickly moved to mainstream popularity. The characters were a symbolic gathering of American hyper-masculine images, and gay persona and clothing. It was an important factor in the ongoing cultural conversation redefining gay or straight culture. In 2020, the Library of Congress identified the village people as culturally significant, including some of their hits in the National Recording Registry. Punk rock will grow up as a small subculture in the 1970s, but will develop powerhouse influence in the 1980s and 90s. Punk fashions embraced the 1950s rebel style based on black leather. They created a new language of aggression that was truly unique. Punk will develop such a strong style that couture designers will copy it. In 2013, the Metropolitan Museum in New York created an exhibition documenting the profound effect punk had on couture fashion. They published a catalog book if you'd like to know more about this. The most important aspects of punk that trickled into the average person's fashion was aggressively ripped clothing worn at first by the small culture of punk fans. It also reintroduced the Levi's 505 model, which was first introduced in 1967 and became a symbol of the punk movement in the 1970s. The slim, tight cut packed a visual punch. It was undeniably sexy, and 505s were the jeans for rabble rousers and artists willing to challenge the staid conformity of the conventional suburban nine to five working life. Another subculture that begins in the 1970s is hip hop. Early hip hop fashion was mainly about flamboyance and presence. Brightly colored track suits and bomber jackets were popular. Sneakers were already an intrinsic part of the culture, especially Puma and Chuck Taylor all-stars. Gold jewelry such as chains, watches, and rings were sought after as signs of success in a street-oriented culture. In the 1980s, hip-hop will also go on to influence mainstream fashion. Let's look at how all of these influences result in a nostalgic look backward in the 1970s. The first was America's Bicentennial, occurring in 1976, but the whole decade was obsessed with American history in preparation for the celebration. Red, white, and blue clothing was marketed, including Americana-style fabrics like gingham, the small cotton checks that occasionally surface in American fashion. The culture developed an interest in the westward expansion, and many people vacationed in the American West during this time. This fueled an interest in traditional fabrics like calico. In 
we can see red and white gingham at the left, and at the right we see the young woman is wearing a calico blouse with 19th century suggested styling. The 10 major influences we just discussed combined with the political and economic disappointment to fuel a drive for nostalgia, that sentimental longing for a time in the past that seems to offer what's missing from our own time. In the 1970s, young people looked back to their grandparents' time, the 20s and 30s, as it could have been. So what if there had been Prohibition, the Great Depression, and World War II? Nostalgia made the past look like so much fun. 1967 is remembered as the summer of love that jump-started the hippie culture, but it was also the year the movie Bonnie and Clyde was released. This movie took two of the baddest criminals from the Depression and put a rose-colored tint on their lives and crimes. Watching this movie, you got the idea that the 1930s and the Depression wasn't so awful. The costumes by Theodora Van Runkle were sensational. Young women began shopping in thrift stores to get that same look, and Bonnie's long silhouette will help usher in longer skirts. In 1974, another film that played into the feeling of nostalgia was released, The Great Gatsby. This movie affected menswear. Ralph Lauren provided the men's outfits and caused another sensation, looking back to a time when men knew how to dress with panache. Fashion reintroduced the three-piece suit and made them available in ice cream colors. One aspect of this overall nostalgia was a rejection of modern life of mass manufactured goods. Looking back to their grandparents' time, young people elevated American handcrafts to a new status, adopting quilting, lace, and crocheting. Fashion designers elevated these humble crafts to create statements. The DIY market created crocheted and knit fads of their own, many based on the square patterns they named granny squares as an homage to their grandmothers. All manner of DIY projects were published in instruction books and magazines. The London fashion scene experiences its own backlash, looking back to the 19th century and Liberty of London, which was a fabric printing company associated with the arts and crafts movement. This rejection of synthetic and mod glamour embraced long dresses they called granny dresses, featuring the small floral prints from Liberty of London. The American version of the granny dress began as a hippie movement adopting long caftan dresses from India. However, by the 1970s, there was one dress brand that perfectly epitomized both the look back at the pioneer era and hippie fashion. It was called Gunny Sacks. The dress line, owned by designer Jessica McClintock, opened in 1967 in San Francisco and featured long dresses that women wore as semi-formal or formal dresses. The emphasis was on romantic, whimsical prairie styles mixed with ideas from India. We also saw the 1970s was an important time for the women's rights movement, with pay equality as one of the biggest social issues of the day. Women were striving to be viewed as indistinguishable from men, especially in the workplace. The gunny sacks line represented an interesting counter to that idea. While some designer trends of the decade feature business-like, androgynous, and confident styles, the Gunny Sachs brand was all about embracing femininity. Ralph Lauren emerges in the 1970s as an industrial designer, creating high-end, ready-to-wear clothing. He hooked into this American nostalgia to create images of a classic American past derived from regional styles of dressing or historical imagery. With the obsession for American history, he presented images steeped in Americana or the upscale 
horse country dream of America we all wished we lived in. And still today, he is repackaging the American century from the 1920s through the 1960s over and over for the American market. In the interest of creating classics, he avoided bright colors of the 1970s, introducing neutrals to the color palette. And he will concentrate on natural fabrics, avoiding the synthetic polyesters of mass fashion. For the first time since the medieval era, many styles are fully unisex. Women adopt men's clothes and men embrace fashion again. Women are beginning to be seen as independent sexual beings, not delicate flowers to be protected. Men are no longer judged solely by their bank account. Unisex clothing was an overt corrective to the rigid gender stereotyping of the 1950s. In the 70s, the term gender began to be discussed as a description for the social and cultural aspects of sex, an acknowledgement that one's sex and one's gender might not match up so neatly. The unisex clothing of the 1960s and 70s aspired to blur or cross gender lines. Ultimately, however, it really resulted in a uniformity that tilted toward the masculine for both genders. Nonetheless, some women found this trend liberating to be freed from the traditional trappings of femininity. A few items of clothing do redefine themselves as truly free of gender identification. The most common one is the t-shirt, with American fashion leading the way that both men and women can wear them. Young people widely adopt logo t-shirts as part of their political statement. The idea was to wear your cause on your chest. It's hard to imagine the t-shirt is a new idea, but I don't recall ever seeing my mother wear a t-shirt during the 70s or the 1980s unless it had a political slogan on it. Otherwise, she wore shirts or sweaters every single day. Another unisex element we saw arise in the 1960s is denim jeans. What was at first a rebellious statement will now be carefully designed and marketed to the masses. It is now a classless and genderless fashion. In the 1960s, European designers noticed that young people everywhere wanted to wear American blue jeans. They were the first to challenge the assumptions of what jeans should be. After all, denim had not been part of their history as it had been in the U.S. In 1964, a French retailer began washing the jeans before selling them, inventing the stone washing process. He then began producing designer jeans with different details. By the mid-1970s, American designers had caught on to the idea, creating distinctive jeans that bore their designer name and trademark graphics, most often as back pocket details. Calvin Klein and Gloria Vanderbilt were the first to market an exclusive jean, although mass-marketed. Those jeans cost about $50, the equivalent of around $240 today. By 1980, there were over 30 designer jeans labels. This is another turning point in fashion history when we begin to develop logo mania. Now for the middle classes, it is not enough to own the garment, but we want the name of the prestige designer on the outside of the garment so everyone can tell we are wearing the real deal. Couture designers, who actually create the most exclusive garments in the world, did not put their names on the outside of their garments until after this moment. One had to be in the know to recognize exquisite clothing and that it was a Dior or a Chanel. And for many men, this was the first obvious name brand garment they ever owned. Both jumpsuits and overalls were marketed to men and women, both derived from workwear, and now they are a bold fashion statement. Vests and sweaters were worn the same way by men and women, 
with a belted vest, a holdover from the 1960s Space Age collections designed by Pierre Cardin. Both men and women wore short shorts with cut-off jeans, shorts, another common street style. Both men and women will share the same fur coat styles with an emphasis on long, lean styles. The most fashionable furs were used as edgings or linings on a fabric or leather coat. The long, lean lines flattered everyone, making them look taller and more slender. As a side note, traditional or conservative dressers will not adopt this style. We can see on the right, they will follow an entirely different trend, reviving the 1920s fascination for exotic furs, such as leopard or ocelot. Caftans and ponchos were both truly genderless garments, as they were adopted from other cultures and had less baggage within Western culture. Women and men both wear their trousers with the same bell bottoms or flare styling. Up until this era, if women wore trousers, they were uniquely styled into feminine versions. Also new is that both men and women shared the same waistline placement in hip hugger pants worn in the late 60s and intermittently through the 1970s. The optical effect is to lengthen the torso and fashion would find that desirable in both men and women at the same time. During the 1920s, the waistline had dropped for women but rose up for men. Hip huggers will return to fashion several times after this. We have looked at 10 major influences, the effect of nostalgia, and the move toward less gendered dressing. All of these influences add up to the appearance of mass market trend driven fashion that bubbled up from the zeitgeist, not necessarily from the Paris couture. Advanced post-war industrial manufacture meant millions of items could be made and distributed in mere months. Those who were connected or had their ear on the street were able to change their looks more readily, leaving mainstream fashion scrambling to keep up. Another result would be instant trends that would be in style today and out of style tomorrow. Two such items were mood jewelry that changed color with your body heat and the smiley button. In the 1970s, Disney responded to both the nostalgia trend and the logo t-shirt trend by reissuing items from their past, such as the Mickey Mouse t-shirt and watch. As a child, I owned all of the items on this screen and I remember feeling that I was part of a group my parents did not understand, which only added to their appeal.